Well, folks, it's uh, lovely to see you. Uh, I think lots of folk are away enjoying the good weather. I think this is now the fourth week of good weather. We, we don't often say that in Northern Ireland. Some folk are even saying I'm fed up with the good weather. I think that's crazy, absolutely crazy. And uh, if this continued all summer, it'd be wonderful. And it's so good to see you out. Just want to remind you that there's a service tonight at half past six and be in the Foy area. So if you're able to come tonight, it'll be great to see you at half past six. Martin uh, will be speaking at that service. I'm in McQuiston uh, for a licensing. So, uh, so it's good to see you. And uh, we trust that God will bless you. Just a, a couple of announcements. Our Holiday Bible Club is in the very last week in, in June. It's uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I think it's the 27th, 28th and 29th. If you're able to help with that, and there was a meeting the other day there, and uh, if you're able to help with that, if you can give me your name and your shirt size today, uh, I really appreciate that, because we won't order the shirts tomorrow, we're going to have polo shirts. And, and so, if you're hoping to help with that, if you can give me your name and shirt size, uh, that would be useful. Remember your, your milk cartons? Okay, we've got a few today. We need nearly 200, and we need it over the next two weeks because I want to build this uh, in a couple of weeks' time. It's two litre milk cartons, but you, you've been very good at bringing some. What you now need to do is you need to say to your children and your neighbours and your friends for them also to collect. And uh, Lorna, do you drink a lot of milk? Good, good. Bring your milk cartons. And even if you're not going to be here, bring your milk cartons. That would be brilliant. Does school have two, two litre ones? Get them in school, would you do that? Oh, there we go, we're flying. We've got a whole school collecting for us. And uh, we're hoping to build a life-size igloo, so we need, we need about 200. So we'd appreciate that. Martin has an announcement. Morning, folks. Um, it's just in relation to um, our access and I requirements for, for anybody who's involved working with children um, or vulnerable adults. Um, if you've been involved, obviously, over the last years, we've all filled in access and I forms, um, but it's time to do it again, unfortunately. It's been, for most people, it was 2011 the last time we filled in an access and I form, and some of the requirements have changed a wee bit. New forms have come out and um, new documentation is required. So over the summer, we're going to do an exercise to try and catch everybody to get them to fill in the ac their forms um, and get, get uh, checked again. It's just something we have to do. Now most of it, so it's access and I checks now probably since 2011. They're online now, so they're, you have to do it on a computer. What's both, you have to fill out a form and then using this form then you access the computer. So I have the forms um, and I have a list of names who, of those who, ha who need to be checked. So come and see me afterwards and we'll give you a form. Um, if you're not happy about going online, we can arrange to um, do it down here in the church using the church computer and we'll go step, take you through it step by step. So come and see me afterwards, please. Thanks very much. The first hymn is, is a lovely hymn. It's, it, it used to be a children's chorus. Actually, it's I am the way, the truth and the life. We'll stand as we worship.
Let's all pray together. Jesus, we thank you that you said those words at a time whenever the disciples were really confused. You were telling them the fact that you were going to leave them and that you were going to go back to the Father. You were really talking about your death. And they got really uncomfortable. And they didn't really understand what you were trying to say. And then you said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. You're reminding us that you're the only way. You're reminding us that not only do you tell the truth, but you are the truth. And you tell us that the only life that's worth living is life with you. Now, of course, we know that we can live life without you. But actually, Paul reminds us as he wrote to the church at Ephesus that this life is only temporary. And it's what happens after this life that counts. And so talking to the church at Ephesus, Paul reminded them that they were once dead in their sins. Although they're alive, they're dead. Just as you spoke to Adam and you said that as soon as you eat that tree of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that he will die. And of course, Satan said, that's not really true. And of course, when they ate that fruit, of course they didn't die. But they did. From that moment, they were dead in their sins. And that's what it means for us. Before we're Christians, We're like the living dead. We're already condemned because of our sin. But you tell us that you give us life. Not only life everlasting, but abundant life, real life. And we thank you for that. And that's why we're here today, to worship you and to thank you for who you are and what you've done for us. We thank you too for being with us this past week. And, and the many activities that we've been involved with. We think particularly of the General Assembly. We thank you for how you're led and guided uh, during those days. And as a denomination, Lord, we want to glorify you in the things that we say and the things that we do. But as a congregation here in Sydney, help us always to be obedient. Help us to be faithful in the things that we do and the things that we say in this area. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. There's very few children out today, but those who are, you you can leave now for for Sunday Pals. It's uh, been good to see you. Our first hymn, we were thinking that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The second hymn is we glorify him because he is the name of all majesty. We'll stand as we worship.
We're going to continue our study in John. We were reading the first part of John chapter 10 where Jesus is saying that he is a good shepherd. We're going to continue in that conversation as the Pharisees come in uh, and they're going to disagree with him and they're going to follow out with him as they've done every way through his, his earthly ministry. So it's John chapter 10 and we'll read from verse 22. This is God's word. Then came the feast of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was in the temple area, walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews gathered round him, saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Again, the Jews picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many miracles from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any of these, replied the Jews, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I have said you are God's. If you call them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, what about the one whom the Father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy because I said I am God's son? Do not believe me unless I do what my Father does. But if I do it, even though you do not believe me, believe the miracles that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Again, they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. Then Jesus came back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. Here he stayed, and many people came to him. They said, though John never performed a miraculous sign, all that John said about this man was true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. Amen. Let's all pray. Father, we come and again we thank you for this lovely day. We thank you, Lord, that we've been enjoying the sunshine. We thank you that it reminds us of your blessing to us. And yet we have to confess that sometimes we're very, very fickle. We almost feel blessed when the sun is shining, but when it's rainy and cold that we feel forgotten about. And we can be like that, Lord. We can, just the way that we feel depends how close we are to you. And we know that that's absolute nonsense. Because you're a great God. And so whether the sun shines or the sun doesn't shine, you promise to lead us and guide us and to bless us. And so we want to thank you again for your blessing. We have enjoyed this good weather, but even if it breaks tomorrow, we know that you're a God who loves us and cares for us and who leads us and guides us. We want to pray for those folk in our congregation who are unwell at this minute. Lord, we pray for those particularly in hospital. Lord, we want to pray for wisdom for the doctors and the medical team who are looking after them. We pray, Lord, that they will know the best treatment for them. And Lord, we pray that your will will be done in their lives. And we pray that they may see that. We know it can be difficult at times in hospital that sometimes all we want to do is we want home because that's what we would want. And that might not always be the best thing for us. And so just as we look at the sunshine and we think that you're blessing us because it's nice and warm, but you remind us that no matter what the weather is like, you bless us. 
We pray for those in hospital. That no matter what is decided, whether it's something that they would see as a good thing, or maybe it will see, be seen as a bad thing, we pray that your will will be done for the very best of those who are unwell in hospital at this time. For more than anything, we want your will for them. And we pray that you will help them see that. Lord, we have no idea what the best is, but we thank you that we know that you do. And so draw close and help those in hospital, particularly be with the families who visit and who are worried or are upset at this time. Give them strength and grace. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to sing again as we, and before we look at this passage. This is a great passage. The, the Pharisees are great at, at complaining to Jesus. But as they complain, we hear some really great things about who Jesus is and what Jesus does and what Jesus believes. And we'll be looking at that in a wee minute or two. But before we do that, we're going to sing In Christ Alone. Let's stand as we worship. <coughs> Way back in, in 1980, Lorraine and I met at Bible College in Berwick and Tweed, and we had all sorts of people uh, at the Bible College. We had this one chap who was upper middle class from London, and we had this other chap who was from Glasgow. Wasn't me? He's from Glasgow, and he had just recovered from being an alcoholic. That's what he said about himself. He was he was about 40, which was really old, uh, and in those days, and. Uh, and, uh, and it was always a bit strange. And so Steve and Tom had a discussion on theology. And it was getting quite heated. It was in the common room. 
uh, at Bible College. And next minute, St- uh, our Tom stood up and he says, Okay, outside new. As soon as I had, oh my goodness, I stood up and said, Look, look, like, just calm down. He says, No, outside new. And, uh, and poor Steve, who was upper middle class from London, said, Outside new. What, 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 what does that mean? I, oh, I didn't know. It's okay. It's okay. I said, and I tried to settle him down. You see, Tom had got to the stage where he realized that, that discussing theology wouldn't work. And what he needed was a good digging. And, and, and so therefore, outside new basically means, right, we'll settle this with our fists. And poor Steve had no idea. And he was trying to say, outside new? Oh, no, dear. And I always, when I, when I read particularly John's gospel, I think you wonder why Jesus doesn't become a class region at some stage. Because at every stage of his ministry, the, the Pharisees are, are, are moaning at him and, and, and complaining. No matter what Jesus says, they've got something to say. And I think to myself, if I was Jesus, I would be saying at some stage, right, outside new. I've, I've had enough. And the only way to settle this is, is a good digging outside. Uh, and, and Jesus doesn't do that. And, and when you read the Gospels, you think, well, would it not have been better for them to ignore the Pharisees? Because they were so negative. No matter what was said, no matter what was done, they deliberately misunderstood it. They deliberately twisted it. And, and surely the writers of the Gospel would have spent better time telling us mostly about the positive things. Because there were so many good things. In fact, John tells that. John says, look, if, if I was to write everything that Jesus did uh, and said then there would be no books big enough to hold it. In other words, there was a ton of material John could have used. So why would he spend time with those nuisance of a Pharisee uh, as, they, as they got together and they were always moaning? Why would he spend time with those guys? You know, why, why would he give us so much information? And you're almost fed up. As soon as you read it and said, and the Pharisees or the rulers of the Jews, your heart sinks because you know that they're going to say something negative. And you think, oh my goodness, it'd be so better, so much better if John had given us so much more of the good things that Jesus did rather than arguing with those boys. Because all they could do, what, what those guys needed more than anything, is a good doing, a good digging over. And, and, and that would have done them rightly. That's what they deserved. Rather than wasting time putting them in the gospel. And yet, actually, when you think about it, I'm absolutely delighted that John has spent time bringing these doer, money faced people in who were completely complaining all the time. Because some of the things that Jesus says when he answers them are absolutely magnificent. There's three magnificent truths here that unfortunately uh, we'll just have to skim at this morning because they're, they're wonderful that Jesus says. And Jesus wouldn't have said them if it wasn't for the money faced Pharisees. And so, so whenever you're tempted to think, if only they were taken out of the Bible, it would be so much better. I'm delighted they're there because some of the things that Jesus has said in the response is really well worth hearing. He says lots of things, but there's three things in particular I want to highlight when he's talking to them. And the first thing is they, they, they start mourning and they said, look, can you not speak plainly? Are you the Christ or are you not? Look, look, just tell us. And, uh, and when you think about it, there's people just like that today, isn't it? If Jesus is God, well, well let God show it. If God exists, why doesn't God show himself? If God exists, why is there so much evil? If God exists, why don't we see him? You know, if, if God exists, why is he hiding in the clouds? And, and, and people would say that to you today. God would have to prove himself to me if, 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 if I have to believe in him. Jesus would have to show himself to me for me to believe in him. And, and we can see that that's not a new thing because the Pharisees said that. And actually, for the Pharisees, in fairness to them, it's not a new thing. The first person to say that, in other words, blame God for, for them not believing, because that's really what they're doing. They're saying, it's, it's your fault, Jesus, I don't believe in you because you haven't shown us or you haven't told us. And therefore, the reason I don't believe is because of you, Jesus. Uh, and that's really what people are saying today. I don't believe in God because it's up to God to show me it's up to God to prove himself to me. And therefore, if I don't believe, it's, it's not my fault, it's God's fault. Because he, he doesn't show himself to me. Uh, and it's not clear enough for me. And it's too obscure for me. And therefore, no, I'm not going to believe. It's, it's God's fault, I don't believe. 
God doesn't show enough. He, he doesn't explain enough. He doesn't make it clear enough. And that's what the Pharisees are saying. Jesus, make it clearly. Speak to us. Tell us, are you the Christ or you're not? The very first person to do that, did you know, is Adam. Adam did it. And from Adam, everybody else did it. We sometimes blame Eve for all this trouble because she was the one who was deceived. Uh, she was the one that the, the, the serpent went to and, and he deceived him. But actually the greater sin between Adam and Eve is Adam. Because Adam knew very well and, and he took the apple. But do you know what he also does? He blames God for his sin. He blames God for his sin. Because whenever God is walking in the cool of the day, what does Eve say? Eve says, well, actually, the Satan or, or the serpent deceived me and I ate. And that's exactly what happened. The, the serpent deceived her and she ate. What does Adam say to God? Adam says to God, the woman you gave me, she deceived me. You hear that? She says, God, it's your fault. The woman that you gave me, you know, it was you that gave me her, she deceived me. And ever since then, we're really good at blaming God for our unbelief. We're very good to say, well, if God would do this, or if God would do that, or if God had not done that, or if God hadn't done this, and there's many people we meet and they say, I can't believe in God because I prayed and he didn't answer my prayer. Or I can't believe in God because if God existed, that wouldn't happen or this wouldn't happen or whatever. And that's what the Pharisees are saying. The Pharisees are saying, okay, tell us plainly, are you the Christ or you're not? And well, what, how does Jesus answer that? Well, the way that Jesus answers that is the same way that God answered it to Adam and is the same that he answers us today. Jesus says, well, I told you. And not only have I told you, now Jesus didn't go around every day saying, I am the Messiah, I am the Christ. But on a number of occasions, he makes it clear to them. And not only that, he says, not only have I told you, but I've shown you with all these great miracles. And remember, we, we, we noticed that in John's Gospel, uh, the miracle is really, the word he uses here is a sign. It's a sign point to who Jesus is. He says, I've done all these things. So it's clear who I am. It's clear who I am. And that's exactly what God would say to us today. And God does say to us today. There is evidence enough that I exist. And there's evidence enough through my word that I love you. I loved you so much that I sent my son to die for you. And so the evidence is there and what I say and what I do to show you that I love you and I care for you and I want you to be mine. And so the fault doesn't lie with God, but he goes on to tell us that it lies with us. He says to the Pharisees, you know, I, I, it's obvious I've said to you and I've done these things, but you don't hear me. And it's carrying on really. This is the second part of, of last week when he says, I'm the good shepherd. He says, you know, you don't hear me because you're not my sheep. You don't recognize my voice. Remember we saw how the shepherd is very different to a shepherd nowadays, where, where he speaks as, and, and the shepherd follows his voice. And probably as he walks along, he sings and he talks constantly. It's almost like having a wife beside you all the time. He talks, con no, no, no. talks constantly. That's a terrible thing to say, but you know what I mean. And uh, talks, talks, talks. My mom was like that. If you went on a long journey with my mom, she just talked constantly. Oh, there's a tree. Oh, there's another tree. There's some grass. Constantly, whatever you were passing. And, and it was lovely. And, and so shepherds were like that. They talked constantly. And so the sheep recognized their voice. And the sheep would follow their shepherd because they would recognize his voice. And he's saying to them, actually, do you know what the problem is? The problem is you're not my sheep. The problem is you don't hear my voice and you don't recognize my voice. That's what the problem is. The problem is, you're not listening. And that was the problem with Adam. He knew the command. You can eat any of the fruit of any of the trees in the garden. You can go north as far as you like. You can go south as far as you like. You can go east as far as you like. And you can go west as far as you like. And you can eat as you have your fill of all the fruits of all the trees. But that one tree, 
don't touch, don't eat. That's the rule. That's the command. Why did God do that? It wasn't to test him, but it was to help him recognize that his dependency is in God. That's why he did it. It wasn't so that he could, he could twist it. It's not like, you know, you, you put out something, you say, now don't touch that. You've seen these wee tests where they put a wee dish and they put a sweet and they leave a child in the room. And you say to the child, don't touch the sweet. And if you don't touch the sweet for 10 minutes, I'll give you two sweets. And then they leave the room and you see the child sitting and the child sits and the child sits. And then eventually the child goes up and touches the sweet. And then eventually the child eats the sweet. Uh, and then when he comes back in, there's no sweet there, and they don't get two sweets. I don't think any of the children actually get two sweets because they can't last 10 or 15 minutes without eating the sweet because it's there. And sometimes we think that that's what God was doing in the garden. You know, there's a sweet, don't touch the sweet, uh, and I'm going to leave you to make sure you don't, but God's hiding behind the tree to see if he touches the sweet. That's not what's happening. The tree of knowledge of good and evil was there to, to help Adam and Eve understand that they could have everything, but their dependency was on God, and they weren't willing to take that on board. They wanted to be self-dependent. They wanted to rule themselves and not be dependent on God. And that's why they ate. And so he says to them, you're not listening. And because you're not listening, you're not following. And therefore, no matter what God says, or what God does, they wouldn't get it because they're not listening. The fault isn't with God. The fault is that they're not willing to listen. They don't recognize the voice because they've never listened for it. They've never turned their ear towards it. And so there's many people today who don't listen. And, and they'll always say, because they don't want to blame themselves. They'll always say, well, God doesn't tell me, or God doesn't speak to me, or, or God can't be fair, or God is this, or God is that. I don't know about God. There's so many ways to heaven. Uh, I don't know how to become a Christian, because lots of people say there's lots of different ways to become a Christian. And people will say lots of different things, but it's really clear in the Bible. And the problem isn't that God hasn't made it clear. The problem is we're not very good at listening. <laughs> So that's the first thing that I think we notice is, is Jesus tells them, you know, that, that he spoke to them and he is the Messiah. Not only by what he said, but what he does. But he carries on, actually. And it's through this again that we get another great statement where he says who he is. He says, I am the Father of one. But it's, it's what he does I want to look at. So there's lots of things we could look at what that means. And we looked at Trinity uh, a couple of weeks ago on Trinity Sunday, thanks to, to Ted. And uh, we, we had a think of what Trinity looks like. So I'm not going to look at that so much this morning, but, but what he says about the Trinity, what he says about himself and the Father. And what he says is, I hold you in my hand, and the Father holds me, holds you in my hand, and no one can snatch you away. No one can take you away. In other words, when God has you, and this is great comfort for us as Christians, because we know what we're like. We know at times we're full of faith and at times we're full of doubt. Sometimes we feel really courageous and sometimes we feel really cowardly as Christians. And the great thing for us, we know that God is holding us in his hand. Apparently, it's never happened to me because I don't have a handbag, but the story's told that in, 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 in Europe in particular, they always say, ladies, you need to be careful how you have your handbag. You should never have your handbag over one shoulder you should always put it over your head and have it across. And the reason for that is apparently in, 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 in Spain and other places, you've got a couple of guys on motorbikes, and what they'll do is they'll come up really close to the pavement, and if they see you with a handbag, they'll grab your handbag and they'll go off in the, in, in the bike, and they'll snatch it. Or if, you, if you're walking along, it's easy to snatch your handbag if you have it just over one shoulder, and so you should always have it over your head because it makes it more secure. They grab the bag, not because your bag is precious, but it's because of what's in it. They don't really care if your bag is damaged when they grab it. They don't even care if you're damaged when they grab it. And so therefore, if they grab your bag and they go off on the motorbike and you trip and fall and smash your face, they're not concerned. They're only concerned of what's in the bag because that's what they're snatching. They're hoping in the bag there's going to be nice things. And people... You hear some stories of people saying, well, everything was in my bag. 
or sometimes people will thank goodness because always in my bag was my dirty hankies and uh, you always feel good when you hear that story you can imagine the guys driving around the corner and open up what we got and it's all these hankies because the woman has hay fever it's not very pleasant you know you, you know yeah that makes you feel good you think that's what they've grabbed because they thought they were grabbing something important and it wasn't but you hear the story of how they grab it as i say and that's that's the word that jesus is using in other words satan would love to snatch you from god's hand he would love to grab you and and it's not that he's concerned for you if you get damaged when he grabs you he doesn't care but he wants to destroy you that's what he wants to do more than anything else he wants to ruin your life that's what he wants to do more than anything else but the picture jesus gives us is that we're in the hand of the father and we're the hand of jesus and because of that satan who would love to snatch you if he was given half an opportunity he would love to snatch you but he can't he can't not because you're strong in your faith not because you're, you're, you're always very, uh, careful about what happens. He can't snatch you because God has you. Not because you have God, but because God has you. And I think that's a wonderful picture. Whenever you feel strong, you don't think much about it. But there's times when you fail God. There's times when you sin. There's times when you doubt. There's times when you're afraid. There's times when you hear bad news. Bad news about other people or bad news about yourself and there's a pit in your stomach and you think oh no and then it's good to remember nobody can snatch you from the father's hand no matter what happens God has you because he is God and he loves you that's one of the wonderful things that God does for us he holds us in his hand and he keeps us safe. Nothing will happen that is outside of his will. Nothing will happen that will destroy us because he has us. And for somebody who, when you think about it, that if people really knew who you were, then they would understand how frail you feel at times and how afraid you feel at times and how you feel that, you know, can I really trust and hold on to God because I don't feel strong? God reminds us, no, no, but I'm holding on to you because I have you in the palm of my hand and nobody can snatch you from there. That's where I have you. And that's something we learned because of the morning face Pharisees and so I'm glad they come into John's gospel quite often. So it tells us who Jesus is and it tells us to what Jesus does. And the third thing, very, very quickly, it tells them what Jesus believes. And so they're, they're fuming at this, that he says, I and the Father are one. They firmly understand what Jesus is saying. And they're, they're annoyed, so they want to stone him. And, and Jesus says, well, well, why do you want to stone me? Sure, sure, your law. And, and, and sometimes what we do is, see when people argue with us and misunderstand, our temptation, my temptation, is to say, listen, I'll wait and bow your head. And, and that means I'll wait and do something else. I'm not interested. I'm fed up talking to you. I'm not going to talk to you anymore. Obviously, we're going to disagree. So, listen, I'm not talking to you anymore. That's my temptation. My temptation is to take them outside. Or my temptation is to tell them, listen, I'm wasting my time talking to you. I'll wait and bow your head. In other words, I'll wait and do something else. And bow your head means bow your head, means do something useful for a change. And in other words, but don't bother me. That's what bow my head means. In other words, I won't do something else. I'm not going to talk to you. You're wasting my time. Jesus doesn't do that. What Jesus does, and he goes on to, to, to actually answer them, even though what they're saying is unreasonable, he then goes on to answer them. And what he says is this. He says, look, even in your law, he's talking about the Old Testament and, and, and the Torah, it says, it says that you're gods, and, he, and he's talking about God's people, and that, that, that they're, they're gods. And he says, look, even there's talking about God. So, so, so are you going to criticize me for that? Because surely the, the, the scripture cannot be broken. And the wee statement I want to pick up, because there's lots of things we can pick up, what he means by gods and, uh, and, and, and how we interpret that today. But I want to pick up the wee statement when he says, the scripture cannot be broken. Because again, the temptation we have in this generation is that we cherry pick scripture. 
I love that scripture which says God so loved the world. But the scripture where all have sinned fall short of the glory of God. Uh, the scripture where, where God loves us and cares for us. But the scripture that we're children of God's wrath. You know, there, there, there's some scripture that I like and there's other scripture that I'm not quite sure about. And Jesus is really saying here, talking particularly about the Old Testament, but it'll be true for the New Testament too, that all scripture is, is, is God's word. And therefore we cannot cherry pick. It would be foolish of us to say that because society believes one thing about something, that we should take those parts of the Bible and we should just set them aside. Not take them out of the Bible, but just set them aside and, and go with the flow. Because if that's what people believe about a certain thing, then we as a church should believe it too. Because if that's what the, church, that's what the society believes about God or believes about love or believes about relationships, if that's what society believes then surely it's easier for the church to believe that too because, because we would be seen as judgmental or, or we'd be seen as inconsistent or unloving if we don't. Whereas the church, we can't do that because if Jesus believes the Bible, then we, his church, need to believe the Bible. We as Christians, when we read it, we've been reading through the Bible and I have sympathy for, for many of you who say this, because I feel like at times myself, so, so, so I'm not disagreeing. But we've been reading through the Bible, uh, and we've taken a wee break for over the summer of meeting together. But folk are saying, I was even talking to, to Ken, Ken will be watching this today from Canada. Uh, I, I was saying goodbye to Ken, uh, Ken and Jean uh, last week, and they said, I'll see you on Sunday. And I said, well, I thought you were going back to Canada. He says, I'm going back to Canada, but the first thing I do when I come back from church is watch Strand. They think Mark does a great job uh, by putting it on YouTube. And, uh, but it's, it's, it's this sense of, you know, reading the Old Testament. I, think, I can't wait to get to the New Testament. Some of these books are difficult. And some of the books of the Old Testament are difficult, without a doubt. But our temptation is, is to read the Bible and think, that's difficult, or, or um, that, that's hectic, or well, that's strict. And therefore, it's not that I disregard it, but I'll set it aside. Because there's other parts of the Bible that, that suit me better. There's other parts of the Bible that are softer and, 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 and more cuddlier. And, and, and those are the parts of the Bible that I'll concentrate. The other parts of the Bible that I'm not sure about, or, or that I'm not sure if I agree with, I, I, I won't say we should take them out, but I'll set them aside. Jesus saw the whole Old Testament as God's word. And if that's true for Jesus, then it needs to be true for us. We need to be consistent. We need to be people who study the Bible and to read the Bible. And even the bits that we're not sure about, the best thing to do is come and ask Danny or, or somebody else who's maybe more knowledgeable and, and we'll talk about it and we'll chat about it. And... Uh, you can talk to Elaine. Elaine would be really good to talk to about those difficult passages. And she would love to spend time with you uh, to talk about those. And, and it's good to read those. And if you're not quite sure about it, it's good for us to talk together and develop it. But it's not good to set it aside and to say, for the sake of society feeling better about us or for people to think that we're nice people, We'll set those aside. Unfortunately, we can't because Jesus can't. And so this passage about the Pharisees who are pain in the necks, who at times could do with a good digging or at times could do with being dismissed, I'm glad they're here because today they tell us a wee bit more about who Jesus is, what Jesus does, and what Jesus believes. And it helps us to follow a Jesus who loves us and cares for us. It helps us to be braver than sometimes we feel because he's always with us to bless us. Let's pray. Father, we come again and we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord. At times when we read it, we have to be honest. We, we don't always understand it and, and we struggle a wee bit. But we thank you that you promise that every time your word is open and read that you speak. And you always tell us something about yourself and you tell us something about ourselves. And you can tell us how we can help others understand you. So help us to stick at it. 
because you always want to bless us. Remind us often, particularly when we're on our own, and maybe particularly when we feel afraid or, or vulnerable, that you have us in the palm of your hand and no one can snatch us away. Remind us of that often. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's worship the Lord with this morning's offerings. A lovely old hymn to finish with, and it's what a friend we have in Jesus. Let's stand as we worship. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest and remain with each one of us now and for always. Amen.
Are you okay tonight? 